Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your eyes, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, I, I hope you do. Obviously, uh, this would be a good place to bring your Bible. Uh, turn to James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. James 1, 19 through 27. It'll be up on the screens later if you didn't bring your Bible, but, but hopefully you have it. If you got it on your phone, uh, that is fine too. I don't know how Carl, what Carl's policy is, but I just want you getting in God's Word when we get in His Word. So make sure you find James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. Uh, we'll get there in just a minute. And I'll be reading out the New Living Translation. Uh, that's just the, the translation I use. So anyways, one of my favorite things, let, let me start off with this. I, I love games. I love playing games. In fact, this afternoon, uh, my son and my wife and, and of course, my, my parents are in this weekend. We were playing a bunch of board games. One of my favorite games growing up was Mousetrap. I don't know if y'all have ever seen this game. Do we got a picture of that? Did I get that? Just kidding. Mousetrap. Have y'all ever seen or heard about the game Mousetrap? I love that game. I mean, I don't know if you can tell it, but it's got like this just smorgasbord of things that have to happen, and you try to get your mouse trap down here in the bottom right corner. I love the game of mouse, mouse trap. Super complex. You know, when I was a kid, man, trying to put it all together, it was just crazy ridiculous trying to get it all, just all the different, I mean, I don't know if you can tell, but there's like one, two, three, four, five, like over 20 different parts that you got to put together in this thing. And uh, one time we lost the instruction manual and it was really difficult. Um, but, but, you know, I got to thinking about, about life. Man, life can be pretty challenging, pretty complex at times, can't it? I mean, I know y'all, some of y'all are in middle school, some in high school. But even at that young age, it can be kind of complex and challenging at times. Am, am I right? Or yes, no, yes, this is yes. This is okay, there we go, yes. Man, and let, I wish I could say that it got easier the older you get. It doesn't. It's, it's still complex and challenging, but, you know, at times in my life, I think, man, I, I wish there was something that just could, like an easy button. You remember the Staples commercial with the easy button? Do you remember that? I love that. I wish I had that. I, I, I see James, the book of James, kind of like that. James is, he's kind of like the easy button for me. When I'm like, man, I, I don't really understand what's all going on. I, you know, I don't know if y'all have heard the words like justification or sanctification, those big, long, huge, biblical-sounding words. Bron, have you hit, had any of those in, in seminary classes yet? A few, few of those, yeah. Great words, man, great things we need to understand. But James, I think James understood that, man, sometimes we just like to hit that easy button. We, we don't like to have that whole complex mess of trying to figure it all out. Man, he just wants to give it to us just plain and simple. Let me give you a little background on James. James, most people um, would attribute that James, the, the author of the book of James, would be James. That's kind of simple, yes. Um, but he was also probably the half-brother of Jesus. Okay, so he grew up, he knew Jesus. Uh, he came to faith uh, in Christ later in life, and he probably wrote this book, I think, in the 60s, 68 AD or so, um, like a long time ago. But he was writing, and he was just saying, hey, listen, let me just break it down. Let me make it real simple. You know, this, the game of mousetrap, a lot of complex things going on here, but if you break it down, it's just one little piece connected to another little piece. And James is like, hey, listen, let me do it like that. Let me break it down for you. And the passage we're going to look at today in James 1, 19 through 27, it, it, he's going to break it down. He's going to give you, I, I feel like, three components, three parts to say, listen, when you're in this Christian life, when you're walking with Christ, these are three things that, that need to be affected, that, need to be, that you need to be working on, that you need to allow God to mold and shape you in. The first one, I think, is your attitude. The second one is your behavior. And the third is compassion. I try to make it real easy for you. A, B, C. Okay, I don't know if you caught that, but attitude, behavior, and compassion. Let's dive into God's Word here real quick in James 1, verses 19 through 27. Like I said, if you don't have it on your Bibles, it will be on the screens, um, but follow along with me either way. It says, understand this. My dear brothers and sisters, you must be what? Quick. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Verse 20, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, has, the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. 
But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you've heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Verse 26 it says this, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Man, first off, James says, listen, let me tell you something. It's your attitude. How is your attitude? In your, is it Christ-like? Do you, do you walk around each day and, and how is your attitude? How are things? How do you take things? And I think he shows us three ways that, that our attitude can be affected. Three areas that, that, can, that can hurt our attitude. First off is how we listen. Do you listen well? Or are you, are you, are you ready and responsive? Do you have a, a readiness to, to listen to what people say? Maybe it's your teachers or, or your, your brothers or sisters or, or your parents. Or, or are you like just trying to get in your two cents real quick? You know, I, for the longest time and even sometimes I struggle with, you know, all right, you know, when, when somebody's telling me something, man, I, I'm, I'm ready to jump in there. My wife had this saying on her, on our board one time, you know, about how, you know, sometimes it's just good to have a filter between your brain and your mouth. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you know somebody like that. It just, whatever they think of, boom, it comes out of their mouth. You know, whether they're, they're, they're not even listening to what you're saying. They're just thinking about what they're about to say to you next. Man, you got to listen. You know, and, and, and if you're not willing to listen, Man, it's easy to get that bad attitude because if, if you're not willing to listen, you're definitely going to be quick to speak. You know, the, the word says slow to speak. God's word says slow to speak. But man, you're going to be quick to speak. You're going to be trying to say something. You know, you're going you're gonna to have some hasty word. It's going to be probably something that you really didn't think of. Like I said, there's going to be no filter for what's going in between your, your, your mouth or coming out of your mouth from your brain. I mean, you're just going to try to say whatever comes to your mind as quick as you can. And then lastly, you know, if you're not listening to what people are saying and if you're just, you're just shooting stuff out, stuff just spewing out of your mouth as quick as it can, man, it's going to be real quick to get angry, isn't it? You know, this says, you know, slow to, slow to speak and slow to get angry. Man, does that anger control you? Do you, do you allow that anger in your, to, to affect you and to, to, you know, just basically be in charge of your life or do you guard against those flashes of anger? I'll be honest with you. You can ask my parents. Um, man, I, when I was a kid, man, I'd fly off the handle to anything. Man, I had a real problem with my temper, with my anger. You know, my mom would be like, you know, hey, hey son, can, can you take out the trash? You know, it's getting full. What, what are you talking about? I don't want to take out the trash. How come I always have to take out the trash? It's, you know, it's not my job. I'm not the only one living here. I had two other brothers, and I was just, I was always mad that, you know, I had to take out the trash all the time. You know, I just, I'd get upset real quick and real easy. You know, my, my human anger would come out. Verse 20 says this. It says, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. And I, I think it's important to understand here the difference kind of between human anger and, and, and Jesus' when he got angry. How I many of y'all remember the time that Jesus got angry in the temple and he drove the money changers out and drove those people out? He made that whip. Man, that, that's a great picture I love of Jesus. But a lot of times we think, oh, well, Jesus got angry, so it's, it must be okay if I get angry. But I, I think James kind of hits the nail on the head here. He says human anger. You know, some, your translation might say man's anger. It's the same thing. What happens with, with our anger? It, it, it's very selfish, isn't it? It's very self-centered. When we get angry, it's because we feel like we've been injustice, in, had an injustice against us. It feels like, you know, you know, I've been wrong, so I deserve to be angry. I deserve to you know, be mad and, you know, pump my fist and you know, yell at you or whatever. You know, do you do that? I saw you, you know, I, I pump my fist. I get, uh, I get upset and mad and angry. You know, but we look at Jesus. And if you read that story, Matthew, where, where Jesus gets upset and he gets angry, you know, so, some translations say zeal. You know, he has some zeal for, for the Lord's house. And his anger was about righteousness and about purity, about bringing, you know, the evil that was, that was in the temple, that was in God's house, and getting rid of that. He wasn't focused on him and making, you know, you know, making him look better or, or fixing some wrong that had been done to Jesus himself. No, it was about finding that purity and, and, and getting rid of the things that were not right. You know, I, I think far too often we, we kind of just say, okay, you know what? I'm going to get angry and it's okay because, you know, uh, you know but, 
But no, God says, no, listen, man, don't let that anger control you. It, it doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. L let me give you an example about how this kind of works together. Um, about two weeks ago, uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I work at Pepsi. I deliver Pepsis. And, and it can be a pretty challenging job at times. Um, lots of long hours. You, you, you're in and out of stores. You, and you literally have to carry, I mean, you got a dolly. But, you know, you got to carry all these cases of drinks. And um, I was getting really discouraged, I'll be honest with you. And, you know, some other people were kind of talking. They were kind of like, oh, man, you know, you know I, I hate this. This is going bad. And, you know, and as they were saying that, you know, as I was supposed to be listening to them, and, and if I'd just been, you know, quick to listen and just listen to them and said, you know, and, and but no, what was I doing? I was already thinking, oh, I know exactly the same thing, man. I, I was in a store the other day, and, you know, the customer was getting mad at me because I didn't have any Diet Pepsi, you know, blah, blah, and then it's just, so I'm already thinking this. And then as soon as they got done speaking, I jumped in there. Yeah, I know what you're saying. You know, this other customer, he chewed me out because I was 30 minutes past the time he wanted me to be there and blah, blah, and, you know, and I'm starting to rant and rave, and I'm getting upset, and I'm getting angry, and, and I come home, and, and my wife, she's like, man, Frank, What's wrong with you lately? I mean, you, you just, you don't seem yourself. Your, your attitude, it's not a Christ-like attitude. It's, you know, she almost, you know, she was like, I'm not enjoying you being at home. And I'm thinking, oh, man, God just really used that to say, listen, man, how is my attitude affecting others? How, how is my attitude how is it? Is it Christ-like? And, and that, you know, God just kind of slapped me around a little bit and said, hey, listen, it's not. Man, your attitude is not one, you know, that's bringing about the righteousness that, that he desires. And I got to thinking about it. I was like, man, man what's going on? What, what's affecting? What, why, why am I having this attitude? Yes, work is hard and it's rough. But I'll be honest with you, it's been rough for like the past two and a half years they've been working there. I mean, nothing's changed about the work. And I got to think, you know what? Man, I, I wasn't able to go to church, you know, the past, that, that Wednesday night. Uh, I had to work late. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not making that excuse, but I wound up having to work late that night, so I didn't get to fellowship with the body of believers then. To be honest with you, I'd been coming in early, about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, so I, there was a couple days there that week that I didn't get to get in God's Word and, and spend that time you know, with him in the morning. And I realized, man, it's amazing the difference missing that time with God and, and getting in his word and listening to what he has to say and how, how it can affect my attitude. But here, here's the thing. It's not just good enough to, to listen to the word, you know, to, to listen to, to me speak or Brother Carl speak. Brian, man, I know that Brian's been speaking some, man. See, it's not just good enough to, to listen to it or, or to even to read it. Man, you can do that. Man, what does God's word say? Check out verses 20 through, 22 through 26. It says this, but don't just listen to God's word. Exactly what I was talking about. Wow, you think I was like smart or something. No, I'm just kidding. I got it from scripture. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Verse 26, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. I mean, I, I, first thing I want to hit here right real quick, because he says it twice in five verses. Uh, verse uh, 22 says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. And down in verse 26, he says, you're fooling yourselves and your religion is worthless. Fooling yourself. L let me kind of clarify that real quick. Uh, I'm not trying to say you're dumb. I just I want to make sure you understand the difference between a hypocrite and, and fooling yourself. A lot of times, you know, people that go to church, you know, I've talked to people, hey man, hey, why don't you come to church with me? They're like, no, there's, it's, a bunch of, it's full of a bunch of hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? Yeah, anybody. Anybody. Awesome. So somebody who does something or says says something, but they do some, the, kind of the total opposite. Yeah, yeah. I'd agree. What were you gonna say, Don? Yeah, say the same. Yeah, yeah. It, it's someone, but basically the, the the thing with a hypocrite is they're doing something to try to deceive 
others. You know, I'm trying to act one way. My behavior is one way. So I'm trying to deceive what you think. Man, James is not, James isn't calling us hypocrites here. In fact, it's, I think, a lot worse. He's saying that we're fooling ourselves. He, he's saying we're deceiving ourselves. What James is talking about here is he's saying, listen, everybody else can see through your little scheme, through your little, how you're trying to act, how your behavior is. James is saying the one you're fooling, the one you're tricking is yourself. You're acting one way. Your behavior is this way. And you're thinking, oh, man, I'm such a good person. I go to church. You know, I read my Bible. I go on mission trips with Carl. I hang out with Carl. You know, I, I'm, I'm good. But, man, the rest of your behavior, when you're at school, when you're at home, wherever you're at, man, it is not godly. It's not Christ-centered. It, it, it's kind of like this. Um, and I love how the analogy here uses here. Check it out. I had this friend in, in high school, or actually it was in college, and um, it was like probably about 10 o'clock, so it, he'd been going around for most of the morning like this. He, he decided he was going to cut his own hair the night before, okay? And, and he had great hair like mine. You know, basically we just, he buzzed it. Um, but he, he got on there and he, he buzzed his hair the night before, and um, he shows up, like I said, it was about 10 o'clock, so, and he'd had two or three classes before that. And I finally run into him, and I'm like, hey, man, you cut your hair. And he's like, yeah, man, it looks great. Don't you love it? And I'm like, yeah, it looks great, except for he had left this patch, like right here, like, like just on the back side. I mean, not like totally bad, but obviously had missed it. And I said, man, I said, did did you look in the mirror after you cut your hair? He's like, yeah, you know, I, I thought I looked good, you know. I, I was like, are you sure you looked in the mirror? He's like, wait, what, what do you mean? I was like, dude, you missed like a huge patch back here. He's like, what? I was like, yeah. He's like, man, I, I checked, you know, I'm like cutting my hair and I'm kind of looking and doing the whole thing, you know, and totally missed it. I mean, I, I don't know if he just, he obviously could not have seen it. But, but, but that's, what, that's what James is saying. He's like, listen, you know, if, if, you, if you glance at yourself in a mirror and you're like, you know, if he'd seen that patch, first thing he'd have done, man, he'd be, oh, I need to fix that. I need to get rid of it. I mean, he says he looked in the mirror. Man, I, I'm praying that he overlooked it, man, because as soon as we got done with that conversation, man, he went back to his dorm room and he's like, you know, get, got the clippers out again. And I mean, he probably spent like two hours trying to fix that thing, man. I mean, he's really intently looking in the mirror. But man, that's the thing. Man, how often do we get up or, or do we look in the mirror and just kind of go about our business and, and, and forget what's happening? You know, listen, it, it's easy to come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays and, and, and to hear the word. But, but are you allowing it to change your life? I mean, is your behavior any different? Are you just looking at yourself in a mirror, walking away with a huge patch of hair on the side of your head? Yeah, that's that's kind of silly, but, but that's, man, that, that's the same analogy that he's talking about here. You know, listen, listen here, here's the deal. I'm not an artist by any means, I, or sculptor or anything like that. M my son was, a couple weeks ago, he was out. We, he, we got some sidewalk chalk, and he's like drawn on the sidewalk. And he's like, Dad, Dad, make me an airplane. I'm like, okay, you know, and I like, I draw this line, and I draw this other kind of line going across it, and a little line on the end. I'm like, there you go, son. There's your airplane. He's like, that's not an airplane. And I'm like, yes, that's all I got, man. You know, so understand, I mean, I'm not creating masterpieces here, but uh, another, real quick, middle school, we had to make these, I had this art class. My art teacher hated me because I was horrible at art. And, uh, but anyway, it's like she gave us this clay and we were supposed to make like the pot or the vase or whatever. You know, we could make anything we wanted to, but I'm thinking I'm going to stick with something simple. You know, just a regular round object with hopefully like a dish type thingy. You know, um, I think Walmart's picking it up. No, I'm just kidding. They're not. <laughs> I spent like three hours on it. You know, I'm like sitting there like, you know, and every time I'd work on it and build it up. It like it look horrible, so I'd have to like break it down. And I mean, anybody like good with art or sculpting or like clay modeling, anything? Yeah. Wh what's the number one? What's the first thing you got to do with like if you're working with clay and stuff? Like once you get it on there and you gotta you get it wet, 
Is, is there any like imperfections or anything? Anything in there you got to get out of it? Like I think, I th yeah, the bumps. Is, you got to like get like the air and all that other stuff out, right? Yeah. Yeah, so like I didn't realize that. So like I'm just trying to build it. And somebody finally told me that, man, you, you got to work it and you got to mold it and shape it and reshape it. And, you know, and I'll be honest with you, it still didn't turn out great. But it was amazing once I started working with it and, and, and really like molding it and shaping it and turning it into, I think my mom thought it was a masterpiece. Hopefully she did. Yes, yes, she still has it, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it, but that's the thing. It, it, I, had to, I had to work with it. I had to mold it and shape it. I love uh, Ephesians 2.10. Speaking of masterpieces, Ephesians 2.10 says this. You don't have to turn there. But it says, for we are God's masterpieces. L l let, me, let me put that in my translation. Ruth, you are God's masterpiece. Ethan, you are God's masterpiece. Jason, you are God's masterpiece. We are all, Ali, you are God's masterpieces. We are all God's masterpieces. And, and, and hopefully my poor illustration of the clay bowl pot thingy that I made of having to reshape it. Hopefully you will understand, man, God is going to mold and reshape you. That, that behavior that you have, your attitude, how you are living, man, God, it, he's wanting to, to shape you into the desires that, that he has for you. Not not to control you, not to make you where you're like, oh man, you know, this isn't, you know, I, I don't want to do this. No, man, God has created you into a masterpiece. Man, he wants to, to mold you into what he wants, you, what, what he's created you to be. But, but I think a lot of times, you know, we, we struggle with that, man. When we get into the word, and we, we just kind of glance at it and just sort of like, mm, okay, that's great, and kind of move on. And we don't allow it to, to change us and to shape us. You know, kind of, kind of like down there in verse, verse 26. Man, this is something I see a lot. Man, it says this, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue. Man, I, I think if James wrote that today, he would be like, if you didn't control what you tweet, what you post on Facebook, man, you know, you'd be fooling yourselves. Man, I, I see so often, man, stuff, man, I see some just, some kids in, in, in youth groups that, that I've taught, you know, I, I don't have, I don't think I follow any of you all on Facebook or Twitter, but, um, but different ones, man, that they're retweeting stuff or they're posting stuff, and I'm thinking, man, I, I don't, I don't think that's what God would desire of them, man, that's not a behavior that he would want them to, to tweet about or to, a picture to post on Facebook, man, man, what, what's your behavior like? Man, what's he doing? You know, because Scripture says, man, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Man, what, what you're saying, what you're tweeting, what you're posting, man, it, it's coming from the behaviors of your heart. It's coming from how you, how you act. And so, so listen, if James is saying, that he's, he's gone through all this, he said, listen, watch out, watch what you're doing. Man, uh, you know, are you looking in the mirror and forgetting what you're saying? He's saying, listen, man, that's not the way... You know, I love it. He says, you know, your religion is worthless. Man, that, that's pretty harsh. But I love how he turns it there in verse 27. He says this, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. I mean, he makes it so simple. He's like, listen, you don't need to be doing this. Here's what you need to be doing. Man, you need to have compassion. The orphans and the widows. How many of y'all have seen those commercials on TV? Um, and man, they, they, they just rip my heart out with, with the, the, or, the, the little kids, the hungry, starving kids in Africa. Or, or maybe the, the dogs. How I many of y'all get the dogs or the cats the, at the animal shelter? Yeah, man, they just they break my heart. I'll be honest with you. Shh, 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 shh. Ch check this out. How many of y'all have done something about it? You, you, you watch the commercial, and I'm, the, I'm guilty just as you, man. I, I see it, that little puppy dog. I mean, he's, he's so sad. Or that, I think the German Shepherd's the one that really tears me up, just the really droopy eyes. And I mean, he just, he looks so sad. And I'm like, man, I feel for that dog. I, I care. I have some concern. But you know what the difference was between care and concern compared to compassion is? Compassion moves you 
to do something. I mean, when I read scripture, when I read about Jesus and when he came across people in his life, what's the number one word that you see that he has for them? Grace, Grace yes. I've already said it begins with a C, ends with I'm passion. <laughs> compassion, yes. Yes, compassion. Man, every time, it doesn't say, and Jesus saw the woman at the well and he had concern for her. No, he had compassion. And every time, man, compassion. Compassion moves you. It challenges you. It says, listen, man, not only do I see something going on in their life, I see them hurting, I see pain, but I'm going to do something about it. Man, I, I love that you guys, you know, go to Kentucky Heartland Outreach and serve and help people in need. I love that, that you go, man, I've seen just the different pictures around your youth room about where you're serving and helping people. Man, that, that's awesome. It's great to do those. Please hear my heart. Man, man, invest in those. Spend those times. Go on those trips. But it's more than that. Man, it, God calls us to daily have compassion and show his love to people. I'll never forget, I, I went to um, Northern Ireland when I was a freshman in college. Amazing mission trip. Saved up some money. Uh, it was a spring break mission trip and, and we went over there for that week. Man, saw God do some amazing things. But as the week was r r wrapping up, God really kind of impressed by my heart. He's like, you know what, Frank? You will go halfway around the world to share God and to share me with people that you have no clue who they are. You've never met them before. But what about that guy that lives right across the hallway in that dorm room across from yours? And you won't take the five feet and go knock on his door and share about me with him. And that, that really hit me hard. I thought, you know what? You're, man, you're right, God. I, I care about people halfway around the world. And like I said, don't get me wrong, man, it is good to go on mission trips. I think y'all got back, was it Costa Rica or uh, a couple months ago? Yeah, I mean, man, man, God, man, those people need the Lord just as much as people here. But, but man, don't just make it a one-time, a one-week, uh, you know, a, a short-term mission trip. Man, we need to be showing compassion to those that we meet. Who is that person in that dorm room across the hall that, that you run into every day? Is it, is it a guy in your science class that gets picked on all the time? Is it that girl who has a locker two doors down from yours, or yeah, two doors down from yours that, that nobody's her friend? Man, are we gonna have compassion for the people in our lives? I'm not talking about pity. It's easy to have pity or to, to even you know, care about a person. But are we going to genuinely show God's love to them in practical ways? Let me tell you something. It, it's going to be messy. It, it's going to take some time. You're going to have to say, you know what, I'm going to invest in this person. My, my college mentor, uh, he said this. He actually was the director of Kentucky Health and Outreach. He said this. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Man, if you're going to have compassion and if you're going to share God's love with them, man, you're going to have to care for them. You're going to have to invest in their lives. You're going to have to spend time in hanging out with that girl that doesn't have any friends at that locker room. You're going to have to invite that kid that's always picked on, hey, why don't you come hang out with me? You know, and, and when your friends start making fun of them, say, hey, listen, that, that's enough. Man, you, you're going to have to get in there. But let me tell you something. If we're going to be like Christ, we're going to have to have compassion. You see, there at the end of verse 27, it says, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Now, I think the number one thing the world says is you've got to live for yourself. The world says, man, you've got to look out for number one. You only live once. You've got to, it's all about you. Man, if that's your mentality, if that's your mindset, man, the world is corrupting you. Man, God says, listen, it's not about you. Man, have compassion on others. Because if we're compassionate, if we show that compassion, that means we take the focus off ourselves, 
And we say, you know what? Man, that, that person out there, that, that other is who I need to care for and have concern. And here's the amazing thing. If we're compassionate about people and if we show compassion to others, and that's going to affect our attitude. It's hard to have a bad attitude when you're caring about somebody else. Because usually your bad attitude comes from you focus on yourself and, oh, poor me, and, you know, I have it so bad, blah, blah, blah. So when you're compassionate, when you show compassion to others, man, you're going to have, have a more Christ-like attitude. And we have a more Christ-like attitude, your behavior is starting to be affected. And, and you're going to start to have behavior that is more Christ-like, and it's a, a, something that God desires. And if your behavior is going after God's desires... You know what God's desire is? To show compassion to people. It's amazing how it all works together and it all comes together. Man, right now, tonight, I I pray that that you will understand, man, that that God wants to create you into a masterpiece. He wants your attitude to be Christ-like, your behavior to be one that, that, that not just you know, listens and, and looks and, and hears God's word and, and then turns and, and goes and acts in a totally different way. And he wants your behavior to be seeking after his desires. And then third, and he wants you to show that compassion, that compassion to people that are in your life. And who, who in your life can you show that compassion to? You know, maybe tonight... And I, I'm not naive enough to think that maybe tonight some of y'all are just like, I don't even have a clue what this guy's talking about because I don't even know Christ. I, I don't even, you know, God wants to create me into a masterpiece. Man, I'd love to come. I'd love for you to come talk to me, talk to Brother Carl, any of the adults in this room. Man, we'd love to talk to you about the creator of this universe, the one that loved you so much that he came and died on a cross for your sins to save you, to make you whole, to make you complete, to, to create a masterpiece with you. Man, he's got an amazing plan for your life. And I, I'm going to pray after I pray. Man, come find myself, another one of these adults. And it, maybe there's something else in your life. Maybe you're struggling with something else. Man, come talk to myself, another one of these adults. Man, we'd love to tell, to tell you about God and, and the amazing things that he can do. And let, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll have some time. Lord, we just come before you now. Lord, it's so easy. It's so easy to get corrupted by this world, Lord, to, to get entangled, to get ensnared by that, that mouse trap, Lord. Lord, I, I pray right now, Lord, for these students, Lord. May, Lord, I pray that they will, will look into your word. They will listen to your word, Lord, and and do what it says. Lord, they, they will not just hear it and then turn and walk away and not let it mold and reshape them. And Lord, you desire to create us into a masterpiece, Lord. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I, I pray now, Lord, for, for this next upcoming week, Lord, for these students. Lord, may they, may they see those students May they see those people that come into their life, Lord, that they need to show your compassion to, Lord. Lord, may they not just have pity or concern or care, Lord, but they will, they, they will actually have compassion, Lord, and, and be moved to do something, Lord. Lord, I, I pray all this in your son's most precious and holy name. In the name of Jesus, amen.